Are you having difficulties with hearing from God? Are you studying God's word but confused about it? Do you want to know if it is God speaking to you from his word? Well, this video is timely. God is about to give you a sign that will convince you of his word. You will become sure that what you're hearing is not just your thoughts or that of the devil. You will experience a fresh and exciting dimension of God's power. Prepare to receive your answers. Before we proceed, if this is your first time on this channel, please consider subscribing. Hit the notification bell for more content, and now let's delve right into it. God's way of leading his people is not rigid and hard to understand, as many might think. God is loving and patient with you through your growth process. When you give your life to Christ, everything becomes a learning phase for you. You must learn to build your faith and relationship with the Holy Spirit. You will also have to get familiar with knowing, hearing, and understanding God's voice. Now, this is where it gets a little difficult for certain people. You might still find it hard to distinctively tell that God is speaking to you even when you study his word. God understands your state and will keep convincing you however he can, especially when you are building your relationship with him. When you have to make big decisions, you might become uncertain of what God is saying to you. This can be because of the pressure at that moment, or even that attachment of your emotions to the decision you are making. This leads us to the question, how does God convince you of his word? It is by sending you signs. God gives you signs to convince you of his word. Now, what are these signs that God gives you? Number one, confirming of his word through people. God will always bring you a sign that he was speaking to you by repetition from other people. This particular sign might be quite amazing when it happens because you might not have to tell these people that you need God to show a sign. Yet, God has a way of dropping the answers to your questions in the heart of these people so that you can believe. Confirming his word to you is a principle that he keeps. You might find that a Bible scripture you studied is emphasized by a random preacher or someone on your social media. God does it this way so that you can be clear beyond doubt that he is speaking to you. Upon the visitation of the angel of God to Mary, as described in the Bible in Luke 1 verses 31 to 36, the angel told her that she would conceive a son. The incredulity of such a proclamation understandably weighed heavily on Mary's heart. To convince her, the angel disclosed to her that her older relative, Elizabeth, was also carrying a child despite her advanced age. This divinely orchestrated revelation was to convince and affirm the divine message delivered to Mary through the angel. Filled with a sense of urgency and anticipation, Mary hurriedly set out to meet her cousin. Upon their encounter, even before Mary had the opportunity to share her astonishing news, Elizabeth, moved by the Holy Spirit, immediately recognized the miraculous event taking place within Mary's womb. Another confirmation to convince Mary of the truthfulness and significance of God's word to her. Luke 2 verses 41 to 44. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Notice how the Bible says that Elizabeth became filled by the Holy Spirit. And she could, at that moment, see what was in God's mind for Mary. She responded appropriately to confirm Mary's encounter with the angel. At that moment, there was no doubt in Mary's heart about the things she had heard from God. God can also confirm to you through the words of others. They may be people you know, they could be friends, mentors, or spiritual leaders, or they could be total strangers. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1 reminds you that out of the mouth of two or more witnesses will a testimony be established. So if God keeps re-emphasizing certain things through others, he has a message for you. When you receive the sign, it will be beyond doubt that God is convincing you of his word. Number two, confirmation through divine revelation. Divine revelation is another way that God convinces you of his words, especially when what he's saying seems too much to comprehend. When he perceives you're in doubt, he speaks to you through dreams and visions. He knows that it will not only prove the validity of his words to you, but also help strengthen your faith. 
especially when you feel that he is leading you on paths you cannot understand. In Matthew 1 verse 20, God spoke to Joseph in a dream about Mary's pregnancy. He was pondering because he couldn't understand what Mary told him about God's will for her. So he got a sign through a dream. An angel confirmed to him that she was telling the truth. The angel told Joseph not to be afraid of accepting Mary as his wife because she had a seal from the Holy Spirit. After hearing from God, he got the courage to do what he was previously scared of doing. God can also speak to you through a word of validation from people you do not expect. Maybe God asked you to do something, but you feel inadequate for the task. In such a moment when you need a little boost, God will convince you of his presence through the words of others. It might just be an innocent conversation that they have with you, but in that short time, all they would say is remind you of your good deeds and virtues and reassure you of God's presence with you. Gideon had the same experience in the Bible. The young man never imagined that he had what it took to lead other men to war or even save his land. But God sent an angel to him who called him a mighty man of valor. Gideon felt flattered by such an utterance and asked for several confirmations, and God patiently fulfilled all of Gideon's requests. Even after asking God for many confirmations, he still wasn't satisfied. When his army was about to fight a battle, he feared they would lose because he had an army of 300 men against troops from his enemy. So God led him to listen in on a conversation in Judges 7 verse 11. That night, God woke Gideon and assured him of victory. He then guided Gideon to the enemy's camp, which Gideon followed obediently but fearfully alongside a servant. However, this fear would soon give way to courage. Judges 7 verses 13 to 14. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. After Gideon heard the interpretation of the dream, he received strength. That innocent conversation encouraged him in the Lord. That conversation, unknown to the Midianites, gave him the boldness to challenge them in battle. God used a conversation to convince Gideon of his word, and he is about to do the same for you. And what other way can God prove his word to you? Number three, confirmation through supernatural miracles. When God wants to confirm his word to you, he will give you instructions through his word. Your obedience to these instructions will serve as a door for supernatural miracles. These miracles will come in moments when you have exhausted all your ideas. There will be no hope of finding a possible solution to that problem. God will intervene in the nick of time. He will give you a confirmation of the instructions that you obeyed from his word. He did this with Peter. In one of Jesus' outreach, he asked Peter to lend him his boat so that he could teach the people. After he finished, he gave Peter, who had been struggling to get fish, an instruction. Luke 5 verses 4 to 7, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. Peter's obedience gave way to a net-breaking miracle. Most times when God wants to confirm his word, he tests your obedience. Your ability to believe him when it doesn't make sense. Your obedience will usher you into the reality or manifestation of that great promise. He's speaking to you through his word. This is why you must not disregard God's instructions, even if they don't make sense. It is an avenue for God to respond to your desires for confirmation. You must be prompt to obey whatever he asks you to do, like the servants at the wedding in Cana. They ran out of wine and Jesus' mother told him about the situation. She also advised the servants at the wedding to do whatever he told them. You sure know what happened after that. The Bible records this miracle to be the first sign that Jesus performed. This sign got his disciples to believe him. God showed how he can confirm his word when you do exactly what he instructs you to do. He also uses such moments to uplift your faith in him 
when it makes no sense to believe? Have you been trusting God for financial breakthroughs or the fruit of the womb? Perhaps a particular verse has been coming to you, but you still find it difficult. It is God's time to visit you and make you laugh again. To make his word a reality in your life, God can ask you to give a seed offering to a family or empty your bank savings for a course. Such instructions sound irrational and illogical, but beloved, common sense does not work with God. If it does, you wouldn't need a miracle so direly. Your logical sense should have saved you. Beloved, when you obey God, you will be shocked to see what you've been clamoring for manifest effortlessly and immediately. That is God convincing you of his word. And do you know the most amazing part? When such an experience happens, you'll no longer find it hard to believe or trust God. What other sign will convince you of what God is saying to you? Number four, confirmation from your Bible. The word of God is powerful and authentic. It is one with God and it will never change. When God intends to show you proof of his presence, he will direct you to his written word. If you've had moments where you are unsure if it's God's voice you heard, you can check God's word. The Holy Spirit cannot contradict what you have read from the Bible. He works with the Father to help you stay aligned with God's purpose for your life. So, he cannot tell you to do something that stands against the words that you study. God's word is present for all times and seasons. The Bible even has a response for the things in your future. Whatever you read in the Bible stays unchanged. In the same way, whatever God speaks through his spirit becomes established as it is in his written word. When God wants to convince you that he is the voice you heard, you will see the same words right in the scriptures. It will happen every time you take out to study. And if that voice you hear is saying something you cannot find in the word of God, then the Father is not the one talking. Even Jesus referred back to the written word. It was his response to the devil when he went through temptation because the word is God's voice. Another sign you experience as a confirmation of his word is an uplift of your spirit. The word has a way of transforming your countenance. It can make the weak strong, give hope to the hopeless, and restore peace to the brokenhearted. Whenever you find yourself gaining strength after studying God's word, it is a sign that God is speaking to you. He is asking you to trade everything in negative, emotions and burdens for his peace. The word of God can make you wise and grant you comfort in moments of distress. This is because the Bible carries God's life and spirit. It is only natural that it influences you whenever you take time to feed your soul. When it is God talking to you, you'll feel this surge of energy and positivity. It quickens the whole of your being. And is that all? No, there are still other ways God convinces you of his word. Number five, confirmation through peace. God can also convince you or whatever he is saying through peace. It could be at a point of making a decision or a confirmation to know if you are on the right part or better still, the need to be convinced of what he is saying at a particular season. One dominant signal that the Holy Spirit works with you is to let you know that God is present. He makes sure you know this by the state of stillness you experience. When you study the word, pray, or hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, do you feel peace? In times of trials and tribulations, do the encouragement from loved ones give you a sense of tranquility? If yes, then God has been giving you signals. God releases this peace to you to help guide your path, especially as you journey through tough realities and life's uncertainty. You must pay attention to God's confirmation through your peace. It will never fail to instruct you on what God is saying to you at every point. This peace will give you stability in chaos. It will also stand as God's approval to proceed with whatever he wants you to do. Even if you cannot discern the voice of God or that of the Holy Spirit, Having an indescribable peace is a good sign of knowing the mind of God. You will be able to tell when he is asking you to pause or move by how you feel because the Holy Spirit will guide you with his peace in your heart. Now that you know the channels through which God can convince you of his word, let's take it a step further by learning what you can do to stay attuned spiritually to pick these signals from God. The first thing that you must do is to ask God for confirmation. Many people are afraid to ask God for signs because of fear. You might think you are expressing doubt whenever you ask God for more validation of his word, but that's not true. It is always better to clarify what you are hearing 
because even the devil speaks half-truth. So there is nothing wrong with you gaining certainty before you make a move. It will help you gain full details of God's message to you. Asking God for confirmation signs shows that you are not self-reliant. It shows that you are a person who waits for God to speak before you take action. It also shows that you believe God beyond your perception of what might seem logical. Anytime God gives you a word you do not understand, it is okay to ask him for more signs so that you can be sure of what you are hearing. When sharpening your skills in hearing God, it is okay to ask God to convince you of what you think. God will always respond to stop you from wandering off the wrong path. God does not want you to make mistakes, so he will show you more signs if you need convincing. Let's look at the story of Gideon from Judges 6. He was a man whom God used to lead Israelites from being captives of the Midianites. When God told Gideon that he was the chosen one to lead the people in a battle against their enemies, to Gideon, that was impossible. Fear and doubt were prevalent in his encounter with the angel. So throughout his story, you will find him always asking God for a sign. The interesting thing about Gideon's story is God's patience with him. At every point, he asked for confirmation and God responded to him. Judges 6 verses 17-18 to 18. Gideon replied, If now I have found a favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. When he asked for this sign, God did not dismiss his request. He also did not seek someone else who would not question his words. God, in all his sovereignty, was willing to wait for Gideon. The process of preparing a burnt offering was time-consuming. Gideon had to kill a goat and prepare everything necessary for sacrifice. Still, God waited for Gideon. This is just one among many signs that God gave him. Whenever Gideon received a sign from God, he took it as a signal. He always moved forward with the instructions that God gave him. Another thing you must do to pick divine signs from God is to stay off sin. Your access to getting a response from God when you ask him for signs is living a life of purity. God cannot stand sin. He cannot lead you anytime he sees you engage in lifestyles that do not honor him. Isaiah 59 verses 1 to 2 Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You must consciously commit to building a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He will always strengthen you to resist sinful ways and live in righteousness. You must learn to keep your heart focused on God. If you are always thinking of doing things by yourself, God will not need to convince you of his word. This is why you always have to surrender to God's will and purpose for your life. Do not lean on your understanding, as your wisdom is not sufficient to lead you in God's path for your life. You must ensure that you surround yourself with godly people. You have to keep a close relationship with God. It would be easier if God confirmed his word through the people around you. If the people around you are not submitted to God, they cannot be channels through which God speaks to you. This is why the company you keep is vital. You have to keep friends, mentors, and acquaintances who also have the same beliefs that you have in Christ. Above all, you must walk with God daily. If you do not make efforts to develop your relationship with God, you will not be sensitive and unable to discern his confirmations. You will miss out on divine instructions that will open doors to miracles. This is why you have to spend time studying God's word. Meditate on it daily and trust the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. If you open your heart to the Holy Spirit, you will start to comprehend the way God works. You have to also take your prayer schedule seriously. As you pray, you can desire God's divine revelation through dreams and visions. You must learn to seek God for comfort when you get discouraged and afraid of the journey ahead. As you keep paying attention to the things that foster your fellowship with God, it will not be difficult to discern the signs that God gives you. Now, how do you react when God finally brings you the confirmation of his word? You must respond in obedience to the signs you receive from God. From the Bible illustrations you will learn today, you will see that most of the characters were willing and ready to obey God's instructions. They put aside their logical explanations. They only worked with the things that God directed them to do. Whether or not God's instructions made sense, they set out to follow, and as they obeyed, 
they got confirmation. You have to learn prompt response. Most of the instructions that God gives to you have a timeline. If you delay obeying these instructions, you might miss out on what God wants to do. This is why you must move as soon as you are certain you hear from God. You must also believe in God. Without your belief in God, everything that God shows you will be useless to you. For God to confirm any sign, he must first see your faith. If you lack faith in God, you will doubt every sign God shows you. You will also never get to the point of obeying him. However, whenever you hear certain whispers in your mind, you must not conclude that it is God's voice. You must check to see if it agrees with God's word. You must discard it if it does not tally with what the Bible says. You must always make periodic inquiries from God, especially when you do not understand the full assignment that God gives you. You can be like Gideon, who always asks for a clear picture before taking any step. This very act led him to victory. Remember, God will not turn you away or punish you when you ask for signs to help strengthen your faith. You can start to notice the patterns through which he confirms his word to you. This will help you become attentive when God drops a message for you. Although God does not speak through one channel, he might choose to work with you as he pleases. This is why you must be discerning. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your love, grace, and faithfulness towards me. I am grateful for your presence that surrounds me and the knowledge of your word. Thank you for being so intentional about me. I worship you for who you are. I am grateful that there has never been a mountain too high or a valley too low for you to reach out to me. Jesus, thank you for never letting go. You have been consistent in catering to my well-being. You are the one who shows me mercy. I am grateful, Lord. Thank you for your outstretched arm of love. I am so honored by how you have dealt with me. Thank you for loving me enough to talk to me, correct me, and hold my hand. I come before you and I ask for mercy. I ask that you wash me with your precious blood and sanctify me in every way that does not please you. Give me the power to say no to sin and help me to always live for you. I do not want to live in confusion. I want to know your direction for my life at all times. I cannot lead my life. God, I surrender my existence to you. Jesus, please give me a sign that you are working to confirm your word. Help me to wait on you, Lord. Keep my gaze fixed on you and teach me not to grow weary. I ask that you give me a heart of obedience and always obey your instructions, even when they seem difficult. Throughout my Christian journey, help me to always heed your word. Teach me to obey you completely with the consciousness that it is for my good. I trust your perfect will for me, Father. I believe that your intentions for me are good and reliable. Therefore, God, help me put my faith in you when you give me your instructions in love. I need your grace to work away from everyone you want me to detach. I ask that you lead me to the right people who will confirm what you said to me. Guide me with your peace so that I can always know what you want for me. I ask that you grant me the spirit of discernment to know what is in the heart of the Father for me at this moment. Help me easily understand the signals you show me. Release to me the strength to follow up the instructions you give me with prompt actions. I need you to give me the wisdom to know exactly what you are saying with the signals I receive. Father, place a strategic system to strengthen my confirmation of your intents for me, God. As I study your word, Lord, feed my heart. Grant me fresh insight from your wells. Reveal to me your desires for my life. Holy Spirit, I ask that you quicken me to remain in you. Have you ever wondered what it feels like to be alive in God? with a heart that beats in rhythm with his. Well, this is only achievable in the life of someone filled with the Holy Spirit. But how do you know when the Holy Spirit is in your life? Certain habits you'll see in your own life will confirm this. Close reading of the Bible indicates that courage, kindness, wisdom, humility, spiritual gifts, devotion to prayer, walking with him, thanksgiving, freedom from sin, confidence, unity, and fulfillment are all indicators that the Holy Spirit resides within you. But how can we know this is the case? Because the scriptures helps us to understand that this is what we strive for, and to see it alive in those who surround us. Daily Devotional Journey is committed to exploring faith through sharing the lessons of the Bible. To join us, please subscribe so we can continue this path together. So, where to begin? Number 1. Bold and courageous. It is quite rare and difficult to see a Holy Spirit-filled Christian who's timid and fearful. 
When you encounter someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll see an aura of confidence around such a person. This is the Holy Spirit at work in a man's life. He empowers you with the courage and boldness to do things you'll ordinarily be afraid to do. First, he'll give you the courage and boldness to preach the gospel. Acts 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This was Jesus speaking to his disciples before his ascension. His disciples before now were timid and without courage, but they became bold and courageous after receiving the Holy Spirit. Do you recall that before then, Peter denied Jesus three times? But with the presence of the Holy Spirit, he preached the message of salvation to a crowd with boldness. And guess what happened? In one night, a great multitude of souls received salvation. With the help of the Holy Spirit, the apostles continued preaching God's word with courage. The Holy Spirit enables them to overcome fear and stand firm amid opposition. It also enables you to do what is right. Apostle Paul said, God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the power to overcome fear and stand firm in faith. You're better able to stand up for what is right and live a life that honors God. The Apostle Paul's encounter with Jesus on his way to Damascus left an undeniable mark on him. Someone once a persecutor of Christians became a courageous advocate for the gospel. Do you know why? Because he now had a new spirit in him, the Spirit of God. He withstood many challenges for the sake of the gospel without shame. This is because he knew that the gospel is God's power for the salvation of everyone who believes. Even Jesus Christ went about doing good and preaching the gospel after the Holy Spirit came upon him. This is to show you the wonder working power of the Spirit of God. He gives you the strength and confidence to stand up for justice and to defend the vulnerable. It's not about being smart or educated. If you don't have God's backing, there'll be no meaningful results. Take a look at Esther's life, for instance. She was a young Jewish orphan who became a queen in a foreign land. There came a time when she had to stand up for her people against persecution. At that moment, she realized the supreme power of the Almighty God she had served. She prayed and fasted before going to the king's court. According to the kingdom's rules, going into the king's court without summoning was wrong. But because Esther saw God's face, the Spirit of God gave her the courage to stand up for what was right. He made way for her, granted her favor in the king's sight, and eventually vindicated her people. Undoubtedly, the Holy Spirit gives you the courage to handle difficult situations with confidence and faith. That is why the Apostle Paul declared that he can do all things through Christ, who strengthens him. With the help of the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to overcome obstacles and achieve great things. As a child of God, if you want to live without timidity and fear, you need the Holy Spirit in your life. Number 2. Someone with the Holy Spirit exhibits the fruits of the Holy Spirit. These fruits are the natural byproducts of a life filled with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you begin to exhibit characteristics that please God. Galatians 5, 22-23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The moment these characteristics are not evident in your life, it shows that you do not have the Holy Spirit in you. Jesus Christ already said that love is the greatest among all the commandments. That is your love for God and humanity. He said that you should love those around you with the love that the Father showed you. But the question is, what kind of love is this? Take a look at Jesus' life while he was here on earth. Jesus came to die for the sins of a world that despised and rejected him. But did he get angry and refuse to give his life in return for yours? No, that is love. One that is pure, unconditional, and selfless. This is the first fruit of the Holy Spirit. Despite the rejection from the world, God continued to love and still loves you. He wants you to extend this same love to those around you. 
but this will only be possible if you have the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you'll have joy and peace beyond human comprehension, the kind that isn't dependent on your circumstances. It doesn't matter if everything is going well with you or not. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. Remember the story of Paul and Silas in prison? Instead of complaining and questioning God for allowing them to remain in prison, what did they do? They worshipped and praised Him instead. The Spirit of God in them helped them remain calm even in an uncomfortable situation. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, He told His disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't harbor trouble in your heart and don't be afraid. A troubled heart is one without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of peace, and He will give you peace and joy in chaos. Then, speaking of goodness and kindness, these are attributes that every Spirit-filled Christian should have. The Holy Spirit compels you to show compassion and mercy to others. He puts the needs of others in your heart and makes you seek to provide for them in a way you can. He also enables you to be patient and learn to control yourself. These are two things that people, including Christians, find very difficult to do. But they become easier with the Holy Spirit in you. He helps you endure difficulties with patience and faith in God, just like he did with Job. Left for the flesh alone, Job would have given up long ago. But because of God's Spirit in him, he endured the test of time. The Holy Spirit also helps discipline your thoughts, words, and actions. He enables you to live according to God's will. The Bible says God's grace enables you to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. As a result, you'll be able to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life even in a perverse generation. Beloved, if you observe your life as a Christian and void of these attributes, it is an error. It means that the Holy Spirit isn't in you. So what do you do? God's Spirit is always available to anyone who desires the sincere gift of the Holy Spirit. So, pray to God for His Spirit to fill your life. Your story will never remain the same. What other habits does someone with the Holy Spirit possess? Number 3. They exhibit uncommon wisdom and understanding. This is another wonderful habit of someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit of God. John 14 verse 26 says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. These were Jesus' words to his disciples about the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is in you, wisdom and understanding will also be evident in your life. Imagine you are a tutor in your child's school. Everyone would expect them to excel because of the extra lessons you'll offer them at home. And if they fail, all eyes will be on you. This is also applicable to your relationship with the Holy Spirit. You can't have the Holy Spirit in you and lack wisdom. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything. The Spirit of God gives you wisdom and deeper insight into the things of God. He teaches you and gives you a better understanding of God's nature. He also enables you to see things from God's perspective. Apostle Paul said that the Holy Spirit gives wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. This means he illuminates your understanding of God's word and helps you apply it to your life. A heart of wisdom and understanding also involves having a teachable spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you become more open to God's instruction and guidance. This was evident in the early church because the Holy Spirit always guided their decision making. This isn't restricted to your spiritual life alone. It cuts across every area of your life, from your career, business, relationships, and education. He instills in you the knowledge and wisdom you need to excel in all these areas. The Spirit of God and Daniel singled him out for excellence. He wasn't better than the others, but God gave him wisdom, which raised him above others in a foreign land. Wisdom is a must for anyone filled with the Holy Spirit because he is a wise spirit. But are these all the habits of one filled with the Holy Spirit? Number 4. They are humble and obedient to God. A heart of humility and obedience is another habit of someone filled with the Holy Spirit. Humility is one very important attribute that every Christian should and must have. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 8 says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, 
He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. When Jesus Christ was on earth, he displayed humility in everything he did. Despite being God, he never considered himself better than anyone. This was the Holy Spirit in action. It is through the help of the Holy Spirit that you admit that you are not the center of the universe. Rather, God is, and with this realization comes a heart of humility and obedience. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is gentle and lowly in heart. As a result, when he's in you, he brings you to a state of surrender and obedience to God. This doesn't mean you'll become submissive to just anything but to God's will. He empties you of every form of pride and self-reliance. Do you know why? God resists every proud man and gives grace to those who are humble. Because the Holy Spirit isn't prideful, he makes you admit that you're nothing without God. It won't be easy, but the Holy Spirit will help you. The Bible says, Blessed are the meek and lowly in heart, for they will inherit the earth. But this is only possible through the help of the Holy Spirit. Number 5. They Manifest Spiritual Gifts 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 to 6 says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone it is the same God at work. Certain gifts are evident when the Holy Spirit is present in a man's life. There's the gift of wisdom, knowledge, healing, and prophecy. There's also the gift of discernment and the interpretation of tongues. When the Spirit of God empowers you, He helps you to develop your spiritual gifts which bring glory to God. This was also evident in the early church, where believers filled with the Holy Spirit exercised their spiritual gifts. Some spoke in tongues, others healed the sick, and some prophesied. This was not just a one-time event. It was a continuous process that took place over and over again as they walked with the Lord. You can try to picture this the way Apostle Paul explained it. He said that just as one body has different parts that perform different functions, the same Spirit gives different spiritual gifts to different people. Nonetheless, this isn't about receiving a one-time blessing. It is about growing your relationship with God. As you yield to the Holy Spirit, He unfolds your spiritual gifts, enabling you to become a more effective witness for Christ. Once a timid fisherman, Peter became a bold preacher and leader after the Spirit of God filled him. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, He stirs up your spiritual gifts enabling you to greatly impact the world. Number 6. They are drawn to prayer and study of God's Word Imagine being so deeply connected to God that your existence reflects His love and grace. A lifestyle of prayer and constant Bible study can change your relationship with God. When the Spirit empowers you, you develop a deep hunger for God's presence and His Word. This helps you focus on these two important habits in your daily life like breathing. You can see that Jesus also modeled this while on earth. He often withdrew to solitary places to pray. If Jesus, being God himself, observed this, it shows how important it is. This is why the Holy Spirit equips you and stirs up a hunger in you to develop a deeper connection with God. The Bible says you should pray without ceasing. When the Holy Spirit is present, he helps you make these two things your lifestyle. But when he's absent, you'll struggle to keep up with prayer. This is what happened to Jesus' disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Their spirits were weak, so instead of praying, they gave in to the flesh and slept. The psalmist said that God's word is a lamp to his feet and a light to his path. That is why you need the Holy Spirit in your life. The Bible says that you should study to show that you are proved by God. Your knowledge of God's word will determine if you're qualified. The moment you find yourself struggling to pray and keep to God's word, you're under attack. The devil bombards you with the things of this world to shift your attention away from God. If you're not vigilant, the devil will weaken your prayer life and play around with it. Aside from all of these, what other habits can you observe in someone with the Holy Spirit? Number 7. A Lifestyle of Faith and Service to God When the Holy Spirit dwells in you, He ignites a fire of faith and service that impacts your world. 
A lifestyle of faith and service to God is a natural outcome of the presence of the Holy Spirit. He deepens your relationship with God and helps you to make a lasting difference in the lives of others. This service to God is not limited to what you do, but also about why you do it. Through your love and desire to please God, your service becomes an expression of your faith. Remember, Jesus Christ said that whatever you do to the least person in the kingdom, you've done to him. This means that service to others is equal to serving him. As you yield to the Holy Spirit, he empowers you to serve with humility, compassion, and grace. You begin to see the needs of the world around you, and you're moved to act with kindness and generosity. A lifestyle of faith and a service to God is a continuous attitude of surrender and obedience. As you heed God's word and obey his commands, you experience the joy of living for his glory. Number 8. They exhibit an attitude of gratitude and thanksgiving. Imagine living a life overflowing with gratitude and thanksgiving for all that God has done and will do. This is the life of someone filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's a life that is available to everyone. When the Holy Spirit is in you, He empowers you to be appreciative of God's goodness and blessings in your life. You begin to see every moment as a gift from God and every experience as an opportunity to learn and grow. No wonder the Bible says that you should thank God in all situations because it is God's will for you. The psalmist, a man whose life reflects thanksgiving, always showed gratitude to God. He said, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God and bless his name. This tells you that thanksgiving to God is a choice that affects your everyday life. The Holy Spirit helps you focus less on your problems and more on God's goodness. Number 9. They prioritize living above sin. Have you ever prayed to live a life devoid of sin, one that glorifies God alone? The world might make it seem impossible to be completely free from the grip of sin, but that's not true. When the Holy Spirit is actively at work in your life, sin cannot hold you down. He helps you to live free from the shackles of sin. As you walk in the Spirit, you no longer gratify the desires of the flesh, and this frees you from condemnation. With the Holy Spirit in you, you can boldly proclaim that you're no longer a slave to sin but a child of God. God says that you should be holy, even as He is also holy. This is the criteria you must meet before you can see Him, and it is the Holy Spirit that helps you to do this if you're willing to submit. Living above sin also means that you have a new nature and the old no longer has a hold on you. That is why the Apostle Paul wrote that if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Every old thing no longer exists in your life. Number 10. Confidence in their identity as a child of God. When the Holy Spirit fills your life, He ignites an understanding of your identity as a beloved child of God. This sparks an unshakable confidence, not rooted in your achievements, but in the love of God. Romans 8 verses 15 to 16 says, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This confidence in your identity as a child of God brings freedom from self-doubt. It also removes insecurity and the need for validation from others. You're no longer defined by your past mistakes, accomplishments, or circumstances. Instead, your relationship with God tells you who you are. You're confident that you're loved, accepted, and cherished by your Heavenly Father. How else can you identify a person with the Holy Spirit? Number 11. Unity within and outside the body of Christ. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, he enables you to live in unity with everyone around you. The body of Christ is characterized by a special bond held together by the love of God. But this is only made possible through the help of the Holy Spirit. This is the bond that the early church had that made them way stronger in faith and expand daily. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it is easier to live in peace with the people around you, not only those in the church but also those outside. This doesn't mean that you're only with unbelievers, no. It is a way of trying to draw them to God by making them feel loved and accepted, not condemned. The Holy Spirit makes you a bridge builder and a peacemaker. He uses you to bring people together in the name of Jesus. Number 12. A fruitful 
and fulfilled life. It is God's desire for you as his child that you should prosper in every area of your life as your soul also prospers. The Holy Spirit isn't concerned about your spiritual life alone. He works in every area of your life to bring out the best in you. He helps you to do all that's required to live a fruitful life devoid of regrets. And you can't access this if you don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Then, when you live up to God's standard for your life, you have the assurance of His blessings. Remember that Jesus said that if any branch doesn't bear fruit, He will cut it down and throw it into the fire. If you don't want to be a victim of this, submit to the Holy Spirit and let Him work in your life. This way, you'll become more like Jesus, who lived a life of perfect obedience and fruitfulness. Through his life, you can see a clear demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, having the Holy Spirit in you is not about speaking in tongues alone. It is about living a life that reflects the beauty and character of Jesus Christ. It's about cultivating habits that bring glory to God and impact the world around you. So, decide from today to embrace the Holy Spirit's presence in your life and start living out these habits. As you do this, always do your best to live a holy life. Don't sin against the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve Him either, or He will become silent in your life. Ephesians 4 verses 30 to 31 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Make sure that all your thoughts, words and actions please God and frequently interact with the Holy Spirit, which strengthens your relationship with Him. This way, you're assured of a sweet relationship with the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, the giver and sustainer of my life, I worship you. Thank you for today's gift of provision, protection, and preservation. I rever your name forever. Merciful God, please forgive me for every sin I've committed. Please cleanse me and give me a clean heart to serve you at all times. Righteous God, I am grateful for the gift of the Holy Spirit in my life. Thank you for all the blessings I enjoy because of His presence. This is a rare privilege that I don't take for granted. Today, you've opened my eyes to see the signs of your Holy Spirit's presence. Please help me use this knowledge to the glory of your name. Please help me live my life with caution and always do the right thing. Please activate your spiritual gifts in my life and help me use them to impact the lives of everyone around me. Please rid me of every form of pride and give me a humble heart that's obedient and submissive heart to your will. Please help me be like Jesus. May I not place myself above but humble myself so that you'll lift me. In any way I've exhibited pride in my life, please have mercy on me. Gracious Lord, let your spirit in my life teach me all truth. Fill me with your knowledge and wisdom so that I always make the right decision in every aspect of my life. Please open my eyes to your true nature and give me the grace to emulate your character. I receive grace from you today to live above sin. I admit that it hasn't been easy living right in a perverse generation, but I thank you for your grace, which is sufficient for me. Please help me not to backslide at any point in my life. Please help me to be a good example to all those you've given to me. And as they see my good works, let all glory be yours. Please give me a patient spirit to endure the test of time like Job did. No matter my difficulties, help me stand firm in faith. Above all, sweet Holy Spirit, please give me the heart to know when you're leading me. Open my spiritual eyes to understand all you want me to know. Whenever I get tired and fall by the wayside, Please pick me up and strengthen me to complete the journey. Whenever I am reluctant to obey your instructions, please forgive me and help me to obey. My comforter, please help me never grieve you at any point in my life. Let my relationship with you continue to blossom like a tree planted by the riverside. Please do not leave my side. I cannot complete this race without you. You're God's precious gift to me, and I cherish you. Thank you, sweet Holy Spirit, for being my advocate. There are things that we call deal breakers in life. These are non-negotiables that keep our relationships on track. Boundaries that if the other party crosses, then we have no choice but to break the agreement or leave whatever relationship we have. For example, cheating is a deal breaker in most romantic relationships. That means that if one partner cheats, the other party automatically leaves the relationship, regardless of whatever explanation or reason is given. In a working environment, being constantly late for work can be a deal breaker too. 
Friendships also have deal breakers. What are some of the things you wouldn't accept from your friends, no matter the situation? As you think about it, please subscribe to our channel so that we can walk this journey called a life together. The life of a believer follows the same principle, to honor God in our lives. We have to dedicate time to the things that cannot be compromised. What though are the non-negotiables? What is it that if you do or don't do affects your relationship with God? We have to define the deal breakers in a Christian life if we are to keep them. In this video, we'll discuss some of the lessons that are not optional but a requirement in your life as a believer. A good Christian life depends on adhering to each of these principles, with the focus being to build a solid, intimate relationship with God. Watch till the end so you may know what area of your life needs an improvement. Number 1. Seek God and flee from sin. Amos 5 verse 4 tells us where life is found. It says, Seek me that you may live. That means that before even starting to live out the other principles, you must first seek and be in God. It is only in the Lord that we have our being and live. That is the word of God. So to have a life, you must be in the Lord. And when I say life, I do not mean in its biological sense, but rather the spiritual life. As a Christian, the moment you move out of the presence of the Lord, you begin to die spiritually. And it's for that reason that this should be the first and most important thing for you. But what does it mean to seek God? God wants us to be in his presence forever. He created us so that we could worship him for the rest of time. However, along the way we lost our path and this important connection that we had with our maker. When you look at the book of Genesis, you notice that at the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, he did not instruct them to do anything to gain favor with him. He did not need them to pray or offer sacrifices to him. Simply, they did not need to actively seek him. However, when they sinned, the initial plan that God had for mankind was ruined. What had once been perfect was now tainted with sin. The relationship of constant harmony between man and God was broken, and now man had to work to win back the favor of God. That is the moment that human beings started to have to seek God for themselves. That is the reason that after the fall of man, we begin to see sacrifices and prayers. Because man had fallen out with God, and he needed to do something, to work for the favor of God. And no, this does not mean that salvation is by works or anything. It means that a once perfect relationship is now destroyed, and being the ones who veered off the charted path, we have to work to make it right with God. And that's where the concept of seeking God comes in. Seeking God means doing things that bring you two together, into a harmonious relationship between an obedient child and their loving father. It means seeking his face, his presence in your life. But you may always wonder, isn't God always with us? Yes and no. Yes, because he says so, and he is true to his words. Matthew 28 verse 20. Behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. And no, because sometimes your actions may remove you from the glory of God and hide his face away from you. There are times when you stop thinking about God. Don't trust him, and find him to be unmanifested. That is, your heart doesn't find him to be a wonderful and magnificent being. During such seasons, the curtain of your sensual desires, the sinful nature that lies deep within you, may conceal his face and the brilliance of his character. This may leave you in a state you feel overwhelmed and alienated from him. And that is why you are instructed to seek his presence continually. God invites you to have a constant awareness of his immense magnificence, beauty, and power. Practically, this means focusing your heart and mind on Him, concentrating all your attention on Him, intentionally choosing to make Him the priority in your life. This is usually a conscious choice you make, a decision to do this even when it is hard, even when you do not feel like it, even if it doesn't tangibly seem to benefit you, even when this very thing stacks all odds against you, even when no one else is doing it. That is what Joshua does in Joshua 24. The context is the idol worship that has become very rampant all over Israel. Joshua relentlessly tries to turn the people back to the worship of Yahweh, yet they remain stubborn. 
He recounts all the great things that the Lord has done for them so far, from freeing them from slavery in Egypt to settling them in cities they did not build and letting them eat from vineyards they did not plant. He reminds them that all God wants is their true and pure worship and presents them with a choice to make, to either worship the true God who has never abandoned them or worship the false gods of the land. But he makes a choice for himself. Verse 15. But if it is unpleasing in your sight to serve the Lord, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The focus is on that last verse. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that is what is required of you when the Bible asks you to seek the Lord. Standing firm and saying, as for me, I will serve the Lord. As for me, I will seek him. I will seek his face. I will take delight in his presence. And you must know, you cannot seek the Lord if you continue to entertain sin. The Bible tells us to flee from sin. You must run from anything that will jeopardize your relationship with God. There are many temptations in the world, and it all comes down to how badly you want to maintain your relationship with God how far you are willing to run so you do not fall victim to the schemes of the enemy. And the Bible sets the standard for you. If it is in your hand that will cause you to sin, chop it off. If it is your eyes, pluck them out. So take a deep hard look at your life. Are you seeking the Lord truly and passionately? Are you fleeing from sin? How fast are you running from it? Remember the Lord knows your heart. And while you can hide the thoughts of your heart from people, they are laid a bare before the Lord our God. Number two, learn how to rely on the Holy Spirit. I will send you the helper from the Father. The helper is the spirit of truth who comes from the Father. John 15 verse 26. It is not easy being a true Christian, living a genuinely righteous life. Jesus himself did not say it would be easy, but he did do something that makes the journey more bearable for us. He sent the Holy Spirit to help us. Jesus has already sent the Holy Spirit, who is supposed to be your helper in this journey of salvation. He is like your assistant. He's more powerful than you, yet he waits for you to let him in. He can't come in uninvited. He waits for you to call upon him, then he acts. The question is, are you making use of your helper? Are you asking him to guide you? Have you even let him into your life? The Holy Spirit is the game changer. He is the one who enables you to live a proper Christian life. He is the one who enables you to seek the face of the Lord. It is very futile to rely on your own power to live righteously. The body, due to its human nature, will always crave sin. It will always seek self-achievement and glorification. Left to our own devices, we will always yield to the me, myself, and I culture. But when you have the Holy Spirit in you, he enables you to let go of that fixation on self and focus on a relationship with God. He gives you the ability to live not to glorify yourself, but God. The Holy Spirit enables you to flee from sin in all its variations. He shines the light of the Lord in your life. He strengthens you to accomplish the power of God in your life. He transforms you from being a mere human being to a spiritual creature, one that communes with God and his son Jesus Christ. He gives you a new identity in Christ and helps you understand the gospel and salvation in new dimensions. He gives you victory over sin. Through him, you can triumph over Satan. He makes your experience as a believer beautiful. You cannot lead a fulfilling Christian life without the Holy Spirit. So seek him today and learn how to follow him as he leads. Number three, pray. Prayer is not a choice. It's a command from God. Prayer is how we communicate with our Father. It's how we commune with him. It is like a doorway to a whole new spiritual realm. It is the most powerful weapon that has been bestowed upon us. Not only must we pray, but we must do that with a pure heart and without ceasing. That is what God expects from you. The first step in seeking God, fleeing sin, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and generally living a truly righteous life is prayer. Prayer is the foundation of your relationship with God. It is the food that you have to keep eating to nurture yourself and mature as a Christian. Sometimes you might wonder, why should I pray if the outcomes are already set? Why should I pray to God, yet he knows what I will say? The whole point of prayer is not to act like a magic wand that fulfills your desires. Its point lies in the process, the conversation you have with God. 
the intimacy of talking to a father who loves you unconditionally, the relationship that comes out of it. Think about your friendships. We all normally have a best friend, close friends, or friends and acquaintances. How do people become best friends? Mostly, it's usually by talking regularly. You meet this person, you click with them because of how relatable you are, and before you know it, you guys are talking daily. And that constant communication forms the foundation of a very strong friendship. The closeness of the people in your life is defined by how regularly you see or talk to them, how much of yourself you give to this person, how far into your own world you're letting them see, how far into their personal life they let you in. Best friends talk daily. They share even the most minute details of their lives. They are involved in each other's lives and they derive joy from it. And this is what forms a beautiful friendship. Now, since you cannot invite God for coffee or FaceTime with him, the only way you can communicate with him is by praying. And since he has already let you in, told you his ways and invited you to his world, what's left is for you to honor the invitation. He has already set his intentions clear. He wants to be close to you. He wants an intimate relationship with you. So if you want to deepen the connection with him, then you have to communicate with him regularly through prayer. If you view prayer only as a way to exert some degree of control over your life and the outside world as some kind of leverage, you will undoubtedly be troubled by what seems to be an unanswered prayer. But if you think of prayer essentially as a constant conversation with God, then you will realize that there isn't really such a thing as an unanswered prayer. It's possible that God won't decide to grant your request immediately or ever at all. There may be times in your life when, for a variety of reasons, you are unable to hear what he is saying. It's difficult when someone declines an offer that seems reasonable and well-founded. However, if prayer is primarily a conversation between you and God meant to bring you closer to him, then his assurance that he will always listen can be the answer your heart has been waiting for. Apart from building your relationship with God, Prayer will help you navigate the chaos of this life like a seasoned sailor. Life as it is already is very hectic, both internally and externally. And honestly, it all gets to a very overwhelming point at times. It is all very easy to lose the bigger picture of salvation and get carried away by the turbulent ways of life. That's why Philippians 4 verses 6 to 7 then states, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. One thing about human beings is we love to worry. We love to complain and mumble when things aren't going our way. We have the tendency to ruminate on negative thoughts. We always envision all the worst case scenarios before we can see the positive side of things. We are always worried about one thing or the other. If it is not our jobs, then it's our families. If it's not our families, then it's next month's rent. If it's not rent, then it's how we're going to afford school fees. There is always something troubling our minds. It's very normal to think about such things. However, all they ever do is rob you the joy of the present moment. All they ever do is show your lack of confidence in the Lord to take care of you. All they do is fixate your attention on very temporary and fleeting things, leaving the ones that truly matter unattended to. Prayer comes in to alleviate you of that worry. It is human to worry, but the beautiful thing is you do not have to. God tells us to cast all our burdens on Him. Imagine you have this heavy load that is weighing down on your shoulders. You have to carry it wherever you go. It is very tiresome and you just wish for someone to take it off you. Then someone offers to do that. This strong being who even the weight of even a million such loads can never be too heavy for him. To him, it's all featherweight really. Won't you happily hand it over? Would you continue to tie yourself out when there is someone trustworthy who wants to take care of you so you can rest? That is what prayer is. God has offered to take all your cares into his hands. From the big ones like diseases to the seemingly insignificant ones like hoping you don't miss the bus. There is nothing too major or too small for God. Even if it causes you just a little worry, carry it to Him. Lay your burdens at the feet of Christ through prayer. Let go and let God. Let go of that little sense of control you have over your life. Trust Him enough to let go of the wheel, rest in the passenger seat, and just wait to see all the beautiful destinations He will take you. Bring all your fears, ambitions, desires, or hopes to God 
through prayer. Trust in him and he will address all your situations. Number four, love. The greatest commandment. It is not an option. It is a command from God. There is no way you can be a good Christian if you do not love. The Bible tells us to first love God. And the way God expects us to show this love is by obeying him. To God, love means obedience. John 14 verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's as simple as that. You might say you love God, but do you obey him? You might listen to this video, read the Bible, pray, give to the poor, but ultimately, the only way you can show God that you love him is by obeying him. Number two, love other people. John 15 verses 12 to 13. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. The bar is already set. Oh, they hurt me. I do not know how I can love them. There are bad people. God expects you to love them still. Jesus said, no gray area. The standard is hereby set for you all to see. Love that person like Jesus loves you. And those of my dear brother or sister in Christ are the deal breakers in a Christian life. These lessons are not choices. They are requirements. Check in on yourself. Are you staying true to salvation? Are you right with God? Are you living like a true Christian?